Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, seventh general meeting of the Managing General Agents Association. And it's my second as your, your glorious leader or chairman. Um, it's my duty to confirm my pleasure that in accordance with our articles we are quorate and we have ten full members here and therefore I declare the meeting open. Um, may I ask for approval that the notice convening this meeting is taken as read? So, all those in favour? Thank God for that. <laughs> Anybody against? Thank you. Now, the agenda is as up there. Um, as per our articles, we've recently held an election for three directors to represent the full members, and I'm delighted to confirm that Mark Birrell and Jeff Turner were re-elected, and that Marco Del Carlo of Tempo Underwriting was the other successful candidate, and thanks to Mark Hudson of Jewel and Byron Shepherd of Policy Access Insure for standing and obviously much welcome to Marco to the board. So this means that the um, full member director representation on the board is um, Catherine Bell, Mark Birrell, Charles Earl, myself, Jeff Turner and Marco Del Carlo. Um, Two further directors were reappointed to represent the two largest members, and these continue to be uh, Karen Beals and Jonathan Skinner of UK General and Penn, respectively. <laughs> Keith Stern of Lloyd's continues as the director representing the supplier members, and Bill O'Malley continues as the director representing market practitioner members. Now, Marco um, will bring additional depth and experience to the board, which is good. And um, he's certainly one of the market's entrepreneurs, and um, that is only to the benefit of the board. Um, we have an ambitious strategy, which um, was something I was very keen that we should bring to the MGAA when I became chairman and we're building the MJA's role and profile, driving increased engagement with the broken market, working with insurers to create greater efficiency, promoting and supporting best practice in training and development, and um, expanding our focus and support to members in the regions um, and um, helping MGAs, or we hope to, negotiate the regulatory challenges and in particular Brexit over the next year or so. So, any questions so far? Ah. That's not something I'm normally accused of, but I'll do my best. Um, now, I, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a bit about the various committees, and I chair the Executive and Finance Committee, um, but I don't want to talk about that, so I'm going to ask Jane Comerford, who's a member of the committee, to review its work for you, please. Okay, um, we want to welcome Constantina Guma um, of Nexus, who has joined the committee this year. Um, Constantina brings, um, uh, she is an accountant, uh, so with Graham Ward, they're both able to help us to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, we have a monthly review of financials, including the budget, variance analysis, bank recs, insurances and risk register. Uh, these are sent to our accountants, butlers, uh, who double-check, and then the committee meets on a regular basis uh, to review those. We keep six months operating costs as working capital held in the deposit account. Uh, we have cash flow monitoring, and the other responsibility of the exec and finance is management of the executive. Um, does anyone have any questions on the finances? Thank you, Jane. Um, 
We have a, a new committee which we've um, started in the last 12 months being uh, for the conference and sponsorship. And I'd like to ask um, Jonathan Skinner to talk briefly about that. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jonathan Skinner. Uh, I chair the conference and sponsorship committee. The, uh, the clue's in the name, and we have two focuses. Uh, firstly, the annual conference, and secondly, the, the inward sponsorship of the MGAA. Uh, both matters are intrinsically linked. Uh, our annual conference is our flagship event, uh, but without the sponsors, uh, the event and many other things wouldn't happen. Over the last 12 months, we've been working very hard to ensure we not only deliver a successful conference, but we also deliver a successful partnership for our sponsors. Uh, on the conference, uh, 2017 was our biggest and best to date, both in terms of attendance and feedback from our members on content. We delivered two great panel discussions around the contents of, uh, around the uh, subject of evolution and revolution. And we had Stephen Catlin as our keynote speaker. Uh, we're working hard to improve the conference again this year. Uh, and a save the date will shortly, shortly be released for Thursday, the 12th of July. This year's theme is MGA's The Future of Insurance. Uh, our focus is on what the sector will look like in the next five to ten years' time. Uh, we already have two great keynote speakers lined up, and we're working on finalising the rest of the day. Full details will be released soon. On sponsors, uh, as some will know, uh, in 2017, we created annual packages for the first time. Uh, pleased to report that, that that has worked well. We've had a, a great level of engagement for our sponsors, and throughout this year we'll continue to work closely with those uh, to ensure it delivers value for, for them and our members. Uh, and just in finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Tokyo Marine, Kiln, Argo, Ergo, BLM and Arch for their continued support. Any questions on that committee? No? Good. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, could um, Catherine Bell will be speaking on the Membership and Benefits Committee. Good morning, everybody. I'm Catherine Bell. I chair the Membership Benefits Committee, or at least I have for several years. And last year, Jeff Turner incredibly kindly stepped up and took over running that committee for a year. So many thanks to Jeff for that. And this year, I've started back in situ again. Um, the key, of our, key aim of our association is to have members joining us who are gaining value for, from their membership of the association. And I'm very pleased to report that increased membership is growing very steadily and very encouragingly with our new membership total being around 221. And that is made up of members, market practitioners and suppliers. And without our market practitioners and suppliers, the association really wouldn't work. And so a big thanks to them for engaging and being part of the association. 2017 was an incredibly busy year. Um, 14 market briefings, two shape and share sessions, with a footfall of 1,800 attendees. And I think we would all agree that to have an average of 80 people attending every event is testament to the value those events offer our members. And uh, you know, a big thanks to Jane and Peter, Teresa and the team for pulling together those events which reflect elements of the market, things that are happening that we're concerned about, things that we want to help our members build on within their businesses. 2018 is a very active year. We are anticipating 19 market briefings, shape and share sessions, a social event at the House of Lords, and, a, and another Bieber stand, which has proved to be very, very popular with our smaller members. Um, the thinking behind the Bieber stand was that when you are an owner of a smaller business, it's very difficult to afford the full uh, stand at Bieber. And so a collaborative approach by, hosted by the MGAA allows members of all shapes and sizes to join in with that very exciting event. Um, the market briefings are podcast. Now, one of the uh, challenges that we had in, as, as an association was how can we be relevant in the regions of the UK, when so much happening in the market is in London. And so we went to quite extreme lengths to make sure that we could podcast all of our market briefings and 
as many of the events that we hold as we possibly can so that we can include people in the outer regions. There were 16 forum meetings held in uh, 2017, which included claims, compliance, finance and IT, and 27 forums and working groups are planned for 2018. One of our key goals was to open a talent initiative which would allow businesses to identify members of their teams who showed talent um, could be part of a succession plan for their business in order to enable them to gather extra skill sets outside of your key business. And because of that, we have organized through Lloyd's and very kindly sponsored by RSA, two talent initiatives which we will be replicating again this year. Um, going back to the Bieber event, I just want to note that the, of the companies joining us for that event this year will be Focus, INET3, my own business, Ptarmigan, Underwriting UK, Sutton Special Risks and Vantage Underwriting. The key goal of our committee is to offer value for members and if at any stage any member, anybody in this room or out of the room has any suggestions of things that we can do to improve what we offer to you as our members, please don't hesitate but to get in touch with the executive or myself or any of the chairs of any of the uh, committees. We're open to all ideas and we're open for business. And on that note, are there any questions? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Catherine. Um, conduct and ethics is chaired by Charles Earl. And perhaps you'd like to say a few words. Good morning. Um, before I cover the, the, the work of the committee, just to say, Ethics, you can take, uh, a business can take a, an active approach or a passive approach. Um, it can either just let it happen or it can try and guide and steer the ethical approach for people within its business. Uh, promote ethics and values to try and guide uh, the behaviour that lies underneath and, uh, and between the specific conduct rules that you write. Uh, I saw an interesting... Uh, analogy the other day in terms of traffic. You know, conduct and conduct rules are traffic lights. You know, stop, go, prepare to go. Whereas ethics are more of a roundabout situation where you have to use judgment as to when to go and when to join the traffic flow or not. Um, hopefully you don't do as I did the other day, put your brakes on at the last minute and get someone up your tail. <laughs> I guess that's the FCA approaching you. <laughs> As your trade association and this committee, we set out guidance for what you and we must achieve ethically. But um, <clears throat> whilst we set out a general approach, all organisations have their own different challenges. So a code that guides you and your people really needs to be written to face the world that you face. Uh, our activity in the year, we meet regularly. Um, our membership has changed slightly over the year in that um, Bill O'Malley has been... Uh, distracted with duties and this sort of thing, so we've got an, an, an alternate there where René Dubois joins us when Bill can't, and René has made a valuable contribution during the year. We've also more recently added uh, two further committee members in Terry Renouf, who was a senior partner with BLM for many years and is now an accredited mediator, so he sorts out the arguments on the committee. Um, and Duncan Minty, a uh, well-known commentator on insurance ethics has also joined us, and they're making valuable contributions. <clears throat> we review any ethical issues, complaints, potential complaints uh, about members' ethics during the year. We've resolved a small number of ethics, in, uh, uh, ethics issues involving members. Um, we've all resolved those all pretty satisfactorily, I think, to all concerned. Uh, we're also now looking at the codes we've published keep them up to date and we'll be making further progress this year with that. We discuss general ethical issues that uh, come to our attention. We monitor the MGA environment and, and general business and insurance ethics. I saw an interesting one's being run around the press this morning on artificial intelligence and I guess it's something we've all got to write if our, uh, watch if our underwriting is that specific. Apparently getting motor quotes, if you get a quote as John Smith you get one price. If you want to quote as Mohammed Smith, you get a very different price, which is a bit um, concerning, and it certainly concerned the Sun, the Daily Mail, and the usual gang. 
No doubt the FCA will be around as well. Uh, and the PRA, I expect. Um, so the regulator clearly has an interest in the ethics of your business, as we've all seen from what's published, but increasingly customers and suppliers um, want an ethical outturn as well. In terms of the challenges of head, they're the, they're the same old ones, conflicts of interest, but this artificial intelligence and complex underwriting is also bringing a, a bigger and bigger ethical challenge that I see. Now, it's not always easy to access every member's ethical codes, and really we're not very interested in auditing our members on that, on that front. I just encourage you to keep them up to date and specific. Um, as I said, we get relatively few ethical issues during the year, which is, which is great, and I look forward to another year of relatively few ethical issues. Any questions? And the final committee is the Legal, Regulatory and Compliance Committee, and Mark Birrell is going to present that. Good morning, everyone. Well, we, work it, we work in a world where, with increasing regulation, in an industry where we have more regulation, and it's fair to say we had a fairly busy 2017 with our committee, and we expect to see an even, even busier 2018. What I'm going to do is just quickly run through what we've been getting up to. Uh, we have regular meetings with the FCA. These happen on a quarterly basis, and we see them with either issues we once raised with them or which members might bring up which we talk through with them, and then we feed back. Uh, this year, we commenced meetings with the PRA. We had two meetings with them. Uh, this is for two reasons. One is they want to find out more about how MJs operate and, and what they do and how they fit into the whole insurance business. And secondly, to get a better understanding to discuss Brexit, which is a recurring theme for our committee, and I'll talk to you about it later on. Uh, we've already got booked in the FCA Open Door session for 1st of October this year, which uh, is always very well attended, and we expect the same this year. And just to give you an idea of what we've got coming up this year, when I say it's going to be busy, uh, we've outlined a few things here. We've got GDPR coming in on the 25th of May, IDD 1st of October, and then we've got IPSS Senior Management Regime and the wholesale market review all ongoing. So there's a lot for us as a committee to go through this year. What else do we do? We monitor all the legal and regulatory developments as they go on. Uh, we supply regulatory calendars and compliance newsletters to all the members. Uh, we have regular compliance managers forums. And this year we put in place the London Lloyd's Market Forum as well where we're using it as a forum where we can really discuss what Lloyd's is up to and try and create closer ties between MJAs and Lloyd's. I think uh, some work the MJA did last year discovered that about 80% of MJA members are actually Lloyd's cover holders. So that's very important for us. Uh, we also have regular meetings with Lloyd's uh, on a quarterly basis where, again, we're discussing topics which we're hearing from our members and getting feedback from Lloyds and really looking to have a closer union with them and likewise with the LMA. And then we put together uh, almost immediately after the vote the Brexit working group where we again we have regular meetings but we had a shape and share session during the course of last year uh, where we had a number of speakers including Lloyds uh, I gave the view of what we're doing at Castell around Brexit. And this is going to be a very busy uh, group, I think, in the next 12 months. Uh, as, as you're all aware, we're operating in a world where you know, if we want to try and rely on politicians, I'm not sure that's the answer. We've got to try and come up with uh, guidance to our members, and we'll be doing that during the course of this year. Uh, we're already working on another shape and share session, which we hope we'll have in the next few months, and will be communicated by the MGAA. Uh, finally, I'd just, just like to thank very much uh, all the fellow committee members for all the work and effort they put in, because I, I know everyone does do a lot for it, and thank you very much. On that note, if there's any questions, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Having created a little bit of minor havoc by <laughs> the agenda, I just wanted to talk about 
what we've actually done in the last year. Is, um, when I became chairman, it was um, important to me that it, I shouldn't just um, rejoice in having been elected chairman, but I should actually um, uh, oversee so, uh, 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 an association that actually does things for its members. Um, and so one of the first things that I, I focus on, a lot of us run our own businesses, and of course, when we do that, um, if we make a decision to do something, it generally happens fairly quickly. Um, with a trade association, what I've discovered is that isn't always the case. Um, actually, correction, it's never really the case. Um, because there's a broad church of people with different opinions, and they all count, actually. And so you can't just make a unilateral decision that suits your particular interest. One has to um, um, listen to, to everybody else and allow them to, to influence it. That can sometimes make it interesting, but um, what we do have is we've united behind an overall strategy. Um, and the board has signed off on what we want to do. And, uh, the key things are we needed to, we, I wanted to look at things that are important to, to us as MGAs. That will involve, um, firstly, um, training. Um, I mean, the IDD that's coming later this year is focusing very much on, um, uh, on the quality of advice given to people and things. And training of staff is important, and it's something that we, we've all done to a greater or lesser extent um, without really thinking about it, but actually we need to be rather more coordinated, I think, going forward. And so what we have done is we have engaged specifically with the CII, um, and there will be an online um, before very long. We, this, this is going to happen, at MGA Assess, which will be uh, an online training kit for MGAs that will be relevant to MGAs. Um, I think that will be something that will not only allow MGAs to tick the box, but it will also actually help develop our staff. Um, Catherine mentioned that we were very conscious that we can be seen as being London-focused. Mm -hmm. And I suppose given that, that we have our presentations and things here in the Lloyds Library, which is very kind of Lloyds to let us have it, um, it does... Um, maintain this, this London focus because it's easy for people in London to come. It's not so easy if you're in, in the regions. And so we, we have tried to, um, to improve our connection regionally. Um, we're also moving on um, with the CII thing. We're looking at the opportunity for MGAs to achieve charter status. I won't go into too much depth about that because um, we've yet to get permission to, to do that, but I suspect it will be something we can talk about more next year. Um, we've got, um, I think this year we had, without a shadow of a doubt, the best conference we've ever had, and we had a lot of people there. Um, I won't say who the speakers will be for 2018, but I, I, I'd rather hope that 2018 will be better still. And we have um, some great speakers lined up for that as well. Um, so what we're beginning to achieve is some tangible stuff that will be a benefit to members. Um, the, um, this will involve probably an in increase at some point in the staffing in, um, in the office. Um, thankfully, we've, as... Um, Jonathan mentioned we've got some new sponsors this year, which has helped our income no end, and it will enable us to afford to do, to, to implement these things. Um, and, um, and many thanks to TMK, Argo, Ergo, BLM, and Arch. Um, but does anybody have any questions on what we actually do? I mean, we're beginning to, to achieve this. Hopefully, you'll see more tangible things over the next year as well. Okay. Um, 
Now, moving on to the um, future strategy of things that, that uh, we haven't yet done but we're working on. Auditing, I mean, uh, just this week we were at Manchester Underwriting, we were contacted by an insurance company with an audit out of the blue when we'd only just been audited by somebody else, and it's so frustrating that they're not coordinated. And Lloyd's is beginning to get its act together. It's not yet successful, um, as we had three separate Lloyd's audits in 2017. Um, but the companies very definitely are not coordinated, and we're, what we want to do is to try to get this much better coordinated, because it takes a lot of effort to um, satisfactorily um, provide the information and look after auditors when they come in. The other thing is that when we, and I'm talking about we, not just Manchester Underwriting, but all of us, when we um, start new relationships with insurers, they all ask for much the same stuff. And, um, and I think that we can help put together a due diligence pack that insurers can expect to get all the time. And, um, and this can link in with the cover holder audit thing. I'm also, it's interesting when one talks to brokers, um, there are some brokers and, and some of them very senior people in the market who operate under the illusion that MGAs just take a percentage of the premium to introduce them to an insurer. Um, now, I'm sure there are some of our members that don't do much more than that, but there's most of our members um, actually add real value, and I think we need to engage with brokers so that they understand that better. And we're not just a, an alternative cheap market or whatever it might be, but um, that we do add value, and so I think we need to put more effort into that engagement and the public relations. Another thing that exercises me quite a bit is, is binder terms, um, which strike me as pretty one-sided um, when one looks at binding authority wordings, particularly on termination. Um, we all, particularly the smaller MGAs, are very dependent on our relationships with insurers. And if the insurer for no um, reason other than their own changes direction and no longer wants to support MGAs, it can leave us high and dry. And if you read the actual terms of binding authorities, um, they're quite draconian and they really are one-sided and that's something that we want to engage with the market on. There's also TOBAs um, and obviously membership. We don't have enough insurer members in my view. If I was an insurance company or a Lloyd Syndicate, I would want to be a member of the MGA. I'd want a strong MGAA so that members of the MGAA can get the support that's needed in these various things that I've talked about and others that, that people might suggest to us or we might come up with. Because insurers, particularly post-solvency too, want MGAs to be professional and need them to deliver um, not just professional, but conduct standards and data standards that enable them to fulfill their own regulatory and business obligations. And one of the best ways of achieving that is membership of the MGAA, which at the end of the day, the cost for an insurer as a portion of their overall income is nothing. And I'm staggered at how few insurers there are. So consequently, what we're doing is, is we're doing a a more in-depth survey of our membership so that we can find out a little bit more about members and then um, we can um, talk to the relevant insurers that do most with MGAs and, and try to get them to be inside rather than outside the, the organisation. So any questions on future strategy at all and, and the things that we're, that we're working on? Okie doke. And I think that brings us on to the report and accounts. Yes. We're now on the right slide. Yes. <laughs> um, now, obviously, at the annual meeting, it, um, we have our annual report and accounts together with the director's report on those accounts. And um, 
So we we want to reappoint Butler and Co. as accountants to the MGAA. And so unless there are any questions, um, would all those in favour please raise their hands? Again, thank goodness for that. Anybody against? Good. <clears throat> There's also a special <coughs> resolution to um, amend the Articles of Association, <coughs> which um, we wanted to earlier this year or last year to review the, or look at the fees and the joining fees and membership costs. And it occurred to us that actually there's quite a tight timetable and stuff to do it. And so we wanted to amend the articles just to um, allow us um, a little bit more time to change things before the AGM. And so um, unless there are any questions, could I ask somebody to propose the special resolution, please? Thank you, Catherine. The seconder. And um, would those in favour please raise their hands? Anybody against? Blimey. <clears throat> Good. And again on the subject of future plans, would Peter please like to um, say a few words? Thank you, Chairman. Obviously, um, the slide's up there, ladies and gentlemen, and you can see what we're going to do. I just want to pick up a few things that have been said today. Um, it was mentioned by Charles that we have the Chrysalis Group. This comes actually driven by Jeff, and it's going to be driven forward by uh, Catherine Bell under the MBC. Um, this is for our next generation. We're dropping the under-35 group. It's the next generation. We had the launch on the 7th of February um, in conjunction with another organisation. We had something like 350 people there. I felt like the old man um, because I would say well over, I am, thank you, David, um, I would say well over 50% of those people were 30 or under. And we were talking things about blockchain. So I'm really quite excited about that. And I wanted to actually express my thanks to our 10 biggest MGA members who have actually put people on that group. And I'm really encouraged by those young people. Mark mentioned about um, Brexit. Yep, very much into our... A domain we have to think about that very carefully but what is also quite interesting is that European people are reaching to us um, we've had conversations with the Gibraltarian people we've had conversations with Guernsey people we're being asked to go and talk to uh, Ireland the Bank of Ireland so there are a lot of people that are very interested in this space and that to me shows us that they actually really need this UK market so we're actually going to make sure that we protect that Again, um, we talk about the regional events, uh, and again, under NBC, we're looking to take um, some of you good people to another region to invite brokers to come and have a chat with us. So that will be along the lines of meet the MGA market. And I think it's another great way of getting us out there uh, and talking. A couple of things that you need to think uh, very serious about. Charles is right to mention the audits. Um, I am actually attending the Lloyd's Audit uh, Conference next Monday, um, and... Um, we're not shrinking violets when previously we did actually challenge the competency of these auditors. So we will be seeing what they're going to do to make sure that we are not disadvantaged and we will regularly go back to them and say, hang on, you can't have a situation where an auditor comes in and five weeks later another auditor comes in looking at exactly the same thing. We know Lloyds are driving forward some big changes and that's great and we will report back to them so that those auditors um, get the kick at the appropriate place, which is very important. One final thing, we actually do look, consult, discuss and respond to regulatory papers. There's a current one running around with regard to the financial ombudsman. Be very careful of that. That's going to incur additional charges that we have to pay. Um, I was quite critical of them when I was in a meeting probably 18 months ago when they're looking to extend their scope to bring in about 180,000 businesses. And as we made the point at the meeting, the reason that these commercial businesses go to law is because of the complexity of those claims. I don't think FOS have the capability. We make that abundantly clear. So please, if you haven't done so, do so. Look at this. It's probably, I think it's around the middle of April, um, which we have to respond. Do look at it and please respond. 
both to the FCA but also to us because we will comply, uh, compile a response to the regulator and we use the lovely words, the body of opinion. And I can only get that if you good people actually respond. Um, so, Chairman, that's me done. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, before I close the formal meeting, are there any questions on, or any other business that anyone would like to raise? Okay. So, finally, I'd just like to extend the boards and executive thanks to all of our consultants and advisors. In particular, I'll mention Dave Matcham of the IUA, who are our landlords, and so we need to be nice to them, but they are very nice to us. And so thanks for their support. David Coop of EC3 Legal, our legal advisor. Uh, Norman Hughes of CMS, who produces what I'm regularly complimented on our compliance newsletter and puts in a lot of uh, work to the association there and Alex Wise of Full Circle Communications on our PR. Um, if anybody's here that hasn't signed the attendance register, please do so. Um, it should be at the desk outside. It's actually on this table at the moment. Go back there. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. That concludes today's proceedings.